This study will introduce you to the use of three major approaches to measuring the effectiveness of different projects. The first one is called net present value, second is payback period, and the third is the accounting rate of return. I'm going to walk you through how to do each of these using Excel. Let's start with net present value. Now for net present value, we're looking at the cash flows. So in other words, we're not looking at the income of the company, which is obviously revenue minus expenses. Instead of looking at it from an accounting perspective, well, we, were, we will start and match our expenses and revenue to the period in which they're actually earned, we'll look at the bank account. We want to know, do we have cash in the bank? And how does that come into the company? Now, when we look at this one, I have a simple sample that has a three-year period. I start with year zero, because that's sort of the initial cash outflow. What you notice here is a negative number because it's coming out of the company. It shows in parentheses in Excel because of the particular kind of formatting that we use. If I come up here and change it to a normal number, you'll see, go to number, it has a normal minus sign. But typically in Excel, we use the accounting format, which causes negative numbers to show with parentheses. So in year zero, we're gonna pay out $100. Now we look forward to years one, two, and three, we wanna figure out how much the cash is coming in in each year. Year one, we've got $10, year two is 50, and year three is 100. Now the key thing here is that the $100 I'm gonna give out in year zero is not gonna come back immediately. Instead, I've gotta wait a while. So whenever I have to wait a while, you have to take into account a couple different factors. One of the factors that's important for this particular project is the time value of money. Money that's received today is worth more than money that's received a year or two years or three years from now. And it kind of makes sense if you kind of ponder it. All dollars have essentially two things. One is inflation. So every year money is worth a little bit less each year. The second one, which is a bigger factor for us, is what we could use the money for elsewhere. Think of it like this. If I have a dollar today, I can stick that into a bank account or a stock exchange and be earning money on it each year. And so because of that, money is worth less in the future than it is today. When we look at the formulas for this, you'll probably be fairly comfortable with the math formulas. So if I think about year one, I get $9 in real value when the actual cash inflow is 10. And that's because I'm going to divide it by 1.1. In other words, 10% is my sort of discount rate or the rate I'm going to use to show the change in value of money from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Now for year two and year three, you notice I have a little carrot in here. The carrot is simply showing that we're multiplying 1.1 by itself a certain number of times or an exponent. So if I was going to simplify this, I could have the very first year is simply the value of one because any number to the power of zero equals one. The second year is going to be 1.1 by itself. The third year, 1.1 times 1.1. I'm going to put parentheses around here to make it a little bit easier to see. And the fourth year, we have 1.1 times 1.1 times 1.1. In other words, we have all three years showing. So this is kind of what's happening here. We have the first year, the present value is simply going to be 1 because that's the initial outlay of cash. In the second year, we're going to reduce the value of the money we receive at the end of the year by 1.1. In other words, we're discounting it by that 10%. In year two, we're going to do it twice, 1.1 times 1.1, because we're going to compound each year. In other words, we have money worth less after one year and it's worth even less after two years because the losses or gains build on each other. This is the same idea as investing money in something. As you invest money, you want for it to compound interest, where as you earn interest, the money gets bigger and bigger, which generates interest the next year. And so it sort of grows on itself. So this is just a math formula to just kind of start with. Now, obviously, instead of doing this, we could write it as the present value formula, which is something that we probably talked about a bit in class before. So in terms of a present formula, we're going to break it down to pieces. So the first thing is the rate. This is our 10% discount rate as before. The second is going to be the number of years. Third is going to be the annual payments. Fourth is the future value. And then lastly, the one at the beginning of the year or the end of the year. So you notice here that for the first one, I again, I have the same formula I have for you know 
zero years, the value is just equal to the value because there's no discounting happening here. For the other ones though, you'll notice that I go from zero years to one year to two years to three years down below me. And you can see that's reducing the value of each of these things. Instead of being worth $10, it's actually worth nine. Instead of 50, it's worth 41. Instead of 100, it's 75. So I'm discounting each year. So this is actually the same thing as the math formula, just a lot easier to write in Excel. You don't have to do as much stuff with the mathematical operators. Instead, you just tell Excel what you want to accomplish. And then I total them all up, and I get the same results as I do for the math formula, where the total value of all of these sums is going to be equal to $26. All these are equal to a total of 26. So we have you know, a fairly straightforward problem here using the present value formula. But you might be thinking, hey, what if I don't want to have a whole column of numbers here? What if instead I just want to have this data over here in my white column and be able to get the ending value point? Well, Excel has that too. The formula that we're talking about is NPV, or net present value, which we can see in row 12. Row 12 is fairly straightforward. All we're going to do is we're going to take the discount rate of 0.1, just like we did in the present value formula over here, or just like we did in the math formulas, and then we're going to take the range. The range here is from year one to year two, year three, year four, however many years you want to include. Notice I don't include year zero here. I don't include year zero because there's no discounting. That initial outlay of cash doesn't need to be changed in value because that's today, right? I'm going to give $100 today, so I don't need to make it worth any less. Instead, I just go from year one to the final year. I add those all together, and I end up with a total value of 125.54. Now, if you notice over my PV formulas on this side, if I look at these three values together, I end up with the same thing, or way around it, 126. Same with the math formulas, 126. So NPV is going to let me calculate basically these numbers and add them together. Now, you might be thinking, well, hey, what about the $100? Well, that's the last step. In this one, I'm going to calculate all of the present values for years one, two, and three. Then I need to get the value I'm giving out in year zero, which is just $100. When I add those all up, you'll see I end up with 25.54, or if I'm going to round it, which you normally would do in Excel, 26. So same exact thing as what I have up here and over here, but I save a couple of steps. And all you had to do for the formula is calculate the net present value give it the discount rate, give it each of the years cash in or outflow, and then subtract the original value. And that'll give you the total present value. So that tells us then that assuming the cost of our capital is 10%, the present value of this project is equal to $26. So let's look at payback. Now payback is a little bit less calculation oriented, it's a little more simple. This is also going to use the cash inflow and outflow. Now, as I've given this to you, you can kind of intuitively see it a little bit easier, I think, but I'll kind of walk through each part. If you look at my example, you'll see that we're starting out again with year zero. I have the initial outflow where I'm going to give $100 negative balance. Now, in year one, I start having a negative cash balance of $100. In other words, what I end with previously. But then I'm going to get $10 in. So if I take the $10 and add it to the negative 100, I end up with minus 90. In other words, at the end of year one, I've got a total project cash balance of minus 90. I still have not paid back my original account, but it's not quite as bad as year zero. Now in year two, I'm going to start with minus 90 which is the ending balance in the previous year, then I'm going to add in the $40 of cash I get. So 90 plus 40 equals minus 50. So now I'm down to half of the initial negative 100 balance. I still have not paid back the original amount, though. Now let's look at year three. In year three, I'm going to get $100 in. So obviously, if I start with minus 50, and then I add 100, I'm going to end up with 50. So I paid back the original account. So during year three, I've hit my payback period. Now, it's not exactly going to be equal to three, though, because you notice that I actually hit zero during the year here. And if you kind of conceptually think about it, you can think, oh, hey, I start at minus 50. 
I end at 50. Therefore, if I divide that in half, that zero point must have happened halfway through the year. In other words, if you imagine each month, you know, you have January, February, March, April, all the way through. Let me do a couple of things on here aside. So if you imagine I get a little bit each month, right? I'm taking in 8.3 a month. And if I do a sum of this one, in other words, a running total, you'll see that it's going to add up nicely. Let me go ahead and make that easier to see. So if you look at my example, a little quick thing here. So in January, we got 8.3. In February, we have a total, another 8.3. In March, we have another 8.3. We keep on adding up. And so we end up with the total kind of earnings. And at the end of July, I've gotten a total of $50 in. So what that means is that in July, I hit the point at which my negative 50 is now gone. So in other words, if I have minus 50 plus whatever I have here, you'll see that I hit that zero point right at June. In other words, halfway through the year. So my total payback period is going to be 3.5 years payback because I want to make back that zero point exactly in June. Now, I made the example easy as you can kind of see here, but sometimes it doesn't conceptually make it as much sense as this. What if it doesn't perfectly line up? So now in this example, I've changed it so that in year two, I get $50 instead of $40. So now my inning balance is 40. I start with minus 40 and I end up with 60. Now you could try and do a table like I have here and try to do the exact same thing. So instead of minus 50, I can change it to minus 40, copy it down. But again, it doesn't quite perfectly line up with my example down here either. So we might need to just do a simple little equation. All we need to do with this one is a simple division problem. We're going to divide the starting balance, this minus 40, by the amount that we're going to earn that year. And when I divide that, I'm looking at the ratio. I'm saying, what is 40 out of 100? And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. You're saying that we're starting with 40, or negative 40, right? And I'm going to pay the, or going to take in the 100 during the year. So what proportion is 40 out of 100? And once I know that, then that's going to give me the part during the year when I went down to zero. Now, if you look at the actual equation, I wrapped it in an if statement just so I don't have to see all the blank values up here. But the key part is the minus D7 over B8. And if I just do that, you'll see the exact same thing, same result. So I'm just going to take that. Now, I have a minus in there because this is a negative number. And if I don't have the minus, it has a minus, which again doesn't make as much sense conceptually. So I think it's just cleaner to put the minus in front like so. So now we say that at 0.4 throughout the year, I'm going to end up at my zero balance. And if you want to just do the math, you could say, you know, I've got 365 days during the year times by 0.4. So it'll take me 146 days throughout the year until I hit the point where I am able to get my payback period of where my net cash balance is zero on the project. Anyway, so I hope that kind of helps explain the process of payback. Conceptually, it's fairly simple. The only key thing you might need to kind of practice a little bit is just the division problem at the end. All you got to do is take your starting balance and divide it by the cash for that year. Let's do the last one, accounting rate of return. Now, the first thing you should recognize with this is that we're no longer looking at our cash inflow outflow. This is the focusing on the accounting rate of return. When you think about it, we're talking about gap, generally accepted accounting principles, or the principle or the idea of matching revenues and expenses to the period that they were earned. And the idea is that we want to match things because if we earn money in a certain year, we want to see the revenue in that year. That's even if we haven't actually collected it yet. In other words, if I make a sale in December 31st, but I don't collect the money until January, I've really earned the money in December. Now, that's good to know when I earn the money. That gives me my, my net income, which is revenue minus expenses. It's different, though, than the cash balance, and both are important. Right? The net income tells me how my business is doing in terms of matching expenses and revenues to when I actually earn them. 
So in reality, I earned the sale in December. However, sometimes I really want to look at it from a cash perspective. Cash perspective is really important if you're trying to say, do I have money to make payroll? If you can't pay your, pay your employees, you're kind of in trouble. And so it's important to be able to know both the net income and the cash. But when you do accounting rate of return, the emphasis here is on accounting. We're looking at net income, not cash. So I've added two columns, book value and net income. Now the first one we have here is book value. This is the idea of saying how much is my asset that I'm using for this project actually worth. So in this example, I've got an asset that is worth $100 and I'm not depreciating it, so it just stays at 100 the whole time. If you want, you could reduce it each time too. So I could take it down to say 90 the next year and 80 the following year. Um, but the idea is though, I wanna know how much book value is associated with this project or what kind of assets am I dedicating to my project? Because again, remember that we're looking at the idea of trying to understand the overall project's profitability. Is this a good thing to put money into or not? And so I need to know how much money am I putting into this? The second thing I'm gonna look at is my net income. So rather than the cash in or out, I'm gonna ask the question, what's my revenue minus expenses, which doesn't exactly equal the cash. Now, all I have to do for this is just do an average of the book value and the net income, and then divide the net income by the book value. Now, when you look at this, you might be trying to think, okay, well, what does this give me? What is this saying? It's basically saying for every dollar I've invested in assets, what net income am I getting out of that? This is useful if I've got multiple projects to compare. Each project might be worth a different amount. So in other words, one project might require $1,000 of investment, one might require $500 investment, and one might require $300 investment. And then if I look at the returns, what income am I getting out of those? All right, the first one might get 100, the second one 100, and the third one, 60. But if I look at these, I might wanna not just look at the overall value. The first one is a pretty solid, right? I may even say, say it's $111. This is the biggest one. This looks really, really good. The problem though, is that it takes a lot of assets for each amount of net income that I'm gonna pull out of it. So what I really want is I wanna look at it as a ratio. What is my net income divided by my net assets? So in the first example here, I have for every dollar that I'm putting in, I'm getting out an additional 11 cents. So every dollar is bringing back a friend of 11 cents. Now, even with the second one, the third one, project B and C, project B is giving me less in net income than project A. But if you look at it as a ratio of my investment, I'm better off with project B than project A because every dollar is bringing back an additional 20 cents. Same thing for project C. Even though, again, I've got less income coming in, as a ratio, I'm making more. And so if I was a CFO I, and had you know $1,000 to invest, I would not choose project A, even though it has the highest net income because project B and C together make a more attractive package. So that's the idea of turning it to this ratio at the end here. You're looking at the average net income divided by the average book ratio to say for the overall project, how much of each dollar I invest comes back in income. Now, if you look at a project with these three different measures, they're gonna give you a different picture. So if I look at my, my problem over here, I've got a studio that's thinking and investing some money, and I'm trying to figure out what's the best one to look at. So I have my net income and I have my cash flow. So I would want again, figure out the basic information. My accounting rate of return is just looking at the total, the average net income multiplied, so sorry, divided by the average investment. So to do that, I'm gonna do average and then look at my net income. And I'll assume that the average invested assets is just 100. So my average accounting rate of return is gonna be 25%. In other words, for every dollar that I invest, how much does each additional dollar bring back? Now the net present value gives me a different perspective. It says, how much is the present value of those cash flows? So what I'm doing is I'm adding up all of the net present values and discounting them at a rate of 10%. Lastly, I'm gonna subtract the initial outlay. In other words, how much did I spend to get those cash flows? 
this C9 value is not going to be um, not going to be part of the NPV formula because I don't have to discount it. It's just money that I'm spending today. And again, I'm going to add it because this is a minus number. If I was going to just write it out, I could write minus 100 there to kind of show it a little more clearly. Um, but normally in an accounting spreadsheet, you would just use the reference here and rely upon the fact that it's a negative number to have it turn into subtraction. And lastly, we have payback period. How long does it take for me to get my money back? Now, each of these tells you something a little bit different. The average accounting rate of return focuses on net income and tells you what your income statement is going to look like. The net present value adjusts for the time value of money, and it focuses on a cash perspective. And the payback is a real simple metric you can use. It's easy to communicate and talk about with people. So each one kind of has their strengths and their weaknesses. If we're going to look at a comparison between them, we'd look like this. Two are going to focus on cash flow, net present value, and payback. The kind of rate of return focuses instead on income. Only one takes into account the time value of money. The payback and accounting rate of return don't look at inflation or don't look at other things that we have to kind of care about when we're talking about cash perspective for a company. We also have different ways of accepting them. If a net present value is over zero, that suggests to me that it's going to be worth money. In other words, it's a positive investment. If it's under zero, then it's a negative investment. And I'm going to lose money on it. The other two options, payback and accounting rate of return, tend to be focused more upon management's choices or management's guesses. Advantages. Net present value is well accepted and takes a lot of factors into play. It's probably the most dominant method that you have. Payback is easy to understand. It's not as sophisticated a method, but it's easy to communicate to people. An accounting rate of return ignores all of the cash balance, but it does tell you about how the net income is going to play out. So each of these three have strengths and weaknesses that you should understand. And if you get these three down, you can pretty easily pick up other methods that are out there as well.